Hi everybody, this is Craig from UR Comp. I'm super excited. We got another Monday interview with Dr. David Schwartz, the head of the Center for Gaming Research at UNLV. Dr. Dave, thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me as always. Awesome. Well, I think this week what we can talk about is kind of the evolution of dining in Las Vegas. How maybe in the 1950s, Dining would be much different than what it is today. So why don't we start off by, maybe you can give us kind of a rundown of what, what was the restaurant options like in 1950s Las Vegas? Originally, you know, even going back into the 40s, but definitely in the 50s and into the 60s, dining was really limited. Restaurants were limited. The focus of the entire casino resort complex was to get the big players down to the craps tables. And anything that detracted from that, they didn't want. So this is why, you know, there was no coffee makers in the rooms. The amenities you would find in most, even small motels, you wouldn't find in big, big Las Vegas Strip hotels because they wanted to keep people gambling. They didn't want any distraction. Now, they kind of had to walk a little bit of a tightrope here. If we make the food too bare bones, too just eat it, get it in your mouth and go on, Nobody's going to go because they're going to want to go there. So they wanted to have some level of attraction of the food, so you would think well of the resort, but they wouldn't want it to be the main player. And that really was the story for a long time, although it did shift later on. Now, because when I think of Las Vegas, especially like early on, obviously it's changed a lot in the last uh, several years, last couple decades. But it was buffets. It was there'd be kind of like a gimmick, like. Dollar ninety nine shrimp cocktail or some like super budget thing they pull people in, and then twenty four hour diner like something kind of yeah. cheap and easy where you can get eggs at three a.m. buffet and then something really cheap and so that seemed to be a strategy for a long time. Would you say that was a strategy just like super value food and that was a hook to get people in at some point oh. in Las Vegas? Yeah, I mean, you had at a lot of properties, you pretty much had the buffet and the cafe, 24-hour coffee shop, and then you would also have the steakhouse, you know, a nice restaurant. So when your players are really good, you comp them to the steakhouse. And that pretty much was the same, you know, in New Atlantic City, I remember when those casinos opened up there, it was pretty much the same thing. You had a buffet, you had a coffee shop, you had a steakhouse, you had an Italian restaurant. Sometimes you might have a Chinese restaurant too, but really those are the staples. It was, you know, and for the fine dining, it was usually we have a steakhouse and we have an Italian restaurant. You know, very rarely you would see something else. Got it. Okay. And then at some point it changed. And was there any turning points or any milestones where it's, it, it signaled the beginning of what we see today, where it's the best dining in the world really can be found in Las Vegas? Yeah. You know, Probably the start of a lot of it, and let me backtrack here, a lot of casinos did have really well-known gourmet restaurants that starts in the 60s, where they will have really fine food prepared by really skilled chefs, but it remained pretty small scale. The International, which opened in 69, kind of took it to the next level where they had this thing, I don't want to call it a food court, because you think about the mall and stuff like that, but they had a court of international restaurants, so they had a Bavarian restaurant. They had Benihana Village, which is still there as far, so far as I know. You know, they had all these different international restaurants fit with the international theme. And, you know, as casinos got bigger, they go from being maybe 500 rooms to being 3,000 rooms. All of a sudden, you need a lot more just space. You have to do a lot more covers every night to feed your guests. Otherwise, they'll leave your casino to go eat, and you don't want them to do that. So, in the 70s and 80s, as casinos got bigger, they added a lot more options just because they needed more scale and they didn't just want to make a 1,000 seat coffee shop. Now, back then, were the restaurants generally owned by the casino or were they leasing out space to other restaurateurs to, to fill that gap? Or? They were usually owned by the casino and they were almost all loss leaders. If you go back and look at the departmental income numbers, I've got a report on the gaming.unlv.edu site. And if you look at dining, you'll see for many years it was a loss leader. 
you know, and statewide, I forget exactly when that flipped. It flipped on the strip first, and then other jurisdictions started to follow. But for a lot, a lot of casinos, actually, literally lost money with the restaurant. It literally lost money every year. Got it. And so when you mean when you say lost leader, it was they deliberately lost money as a as a tool, as a as a marketing yeah. tool to bring people in the door and yeah, make so money in other areas. Yeah, so it's like on Black Friday, you've got your doorbuster deal with the, you know, TV for two ninety nine, and you're going to lose money in that. But while they're there, they're going to buy the other gifts. That's exactly what it was. Like, okay, we're going to lose money with the shrimp cocktail. We're going to lose money with the prime rib special, the five ninety nine prime prime rib special. But once they're here for the shrimp, the ninety nine cent shrimp shrimp cocktail or the prime rib special, they will stay and they will gamble. That was the idea, and it actually worked. Wow. Okay. So, they, and that actually coincides with kind of that image that I had from back in the day of just super cheap things that gets people in the door. I mean, tourists that are coming in from out of town, they say, oh, there's two ninety nine buffet, and then they sit down and play blackjack for a while after. And then at some point, so you're saying they're, the international other restaurants started uh, developing more fine dining. Mm -hmm. Then what, was, what would you say was kind of the next milestone that signaled the shift in dining in Las Vegas? Well, the next big change was 1992 when Spago opened at Forum Shops. This was Wolfgang Puck's restaurant, and pretty much everyone agrees this was the first real celebrity chef restaurant in Las Vegas. You know, he, of course, was a famous Beverly Hills chef, you know, had a pretty big reputation, opened something up in Las Vegas, and it was very successful. So right away, other people started to get on that bandwagon. Gotcha. Okay. And then would you say that another wave of celebrity chefs uh, came in after Food Networks and things like that came on? Because for me personally, yeah. I guess I've uh, Wolfgang Puck, Puck has always been kind of a name that I remember, but it seems like Food Network all of a sudden spawned this whole new generation of celebrity chefs. And yeah. So we've got a whole bunch of them, you know, from Giada to Gordon Ramsay to Guy Fieri you know, to Bobby Flay, you know, there's just so many people. I think the knowledge of who chefs are is just so much higher now than it was before the Food Network and all those reality shows. I think that made a lot of stars. And in return, a lot of them figured out what's a good way that I can capitalize in this. Well, if I give my name to a restaurant in Las Vegas in the Strip, uh, we could all make pretty good money. And they do make pretty good money. And what what's the economics of a restaurant where... It's a, a celebrity restaurant. It, do they typically, do the celebrity chefs typically own a percentage of the restaurant in partnership with the casino? Is it the celebrity chef owns a restaurant and pays a There's lease to the casino? There's different ways they can do it. They can, they can license their name. They can also have where it's operated by a third party, so not operated by the casino. So each of them are going to be different. Um, there's not, I don't think there's one model, but usually the one common factor is that that celebrity chef is probably not going to be in the premises, you know, most of the year. You know, if you look at, let's say, Gordon Ramsay, he has now, what, four restaurants in Vegas? So even if he wanted, even if he moved to Vegas full time, still out of seven days of the week, and I assume Gordon's going to want a couple of days off, you know, you've got, what, a one in four chance of him being in there. So the odds are not going to be in your favor for them to actually be there. But they do supervise the menu and they do set the tone. Got it. Okay. And... And I know that the cost structure, I mean, obviously, the, uh, they're paying that celebrity chef to use the brand a lot. And what's interesting from, from my perspective, where we're helping players get comp to different casinos, uh, the cost is a lot more expensive than something that's wholly owned. For example, like Golden Nugget, yeah. you know, Fertitta owns Landry's. All the restaurants in the Golden Nugget are owned by the casino, and they seem to be a lot more loose with comps because their cost is a lot lower than say um, Giada or something like that where yeah. there's just more cost at the casino for a meal. Yeah and that's what they have to do. They kind of have to negotiate that and that's sort of the cost of doing business. If you want Giada you've got you're gonna have to sacrifice something and it's not going to be quite as easy and I know sometimes getting comp with Caesars they can be very restricted in which restaurants you could use those comps at and you know that's not just the casino being mean to you 
that's for pretty good reasons. You know, there's financial reasons for that. So, yeah, they it, it does restrict a little bit of what you can do. And it's not like the old days where they owned everything and, you know, whatever you wanted, you could get. You know, maybe not always today. Got it. And it's kind of funny how Las Vegas, I don't know if there's there's stats on, like, the cost per plate versus anywhere else in the country, maybe aside from, like, New York or Beverly Hills you allude to, but it's expensive dining. And it's funny because you got to assume with the economy of scale and, like, how much of all these raw products, like beef and, you know, everything that goes into the yeah. restaurant that Caesars Corporation or MGM Corporation or any of them are buying in bulk, they must be spending less than anybody on the actual hard cost of the food, but it's just like the celebrity chef, the real estate, everything else just, and now wanting to turn a profit yeah, that, that just jacks up the price. So actually maybe why don't we loop back to kind of what you alluded to earlier, how restaurants were a loss leader mm -hmm. for a long time. And then when do, when do you think the mindset of Las Vegas really shifted from let's use restaurant as something we lose money on to get people in to let's make money on this. It's kind of funny, you know, I'm thinking you could just have a big chart somewhere and just the top, the head of the chart could be this changed with the Mirage. And then pretty much every aspect of operations would go in there because yes, and I feel like I'm a broken record sometimes, this changed with the Mirage. Before the Mirage, it was that loss leader mentality. Steve Wynn showed that yes, you can run the entire company profitably if you make money off of everything and that's why people started to do it you know he was under a lot of pressure when they built the mirage it was going to have to turn over 1.1 million dollars a day for them to break even how do you do that well you can't just rely on people gambling because it may not you know you, if it's a big game like Bach it might go against the house so you need that underlying base that's where that's how they design the restaurants and I was lucky enough to interview Bobby Baldwin who was Wynn's chief of operations back then and now is chief of operations for City Center, Aria. And he, you know, this is what kept him up at night. Well, how do we get this? How can we make money in this? And it was really, you know, he's the guy who actually designed a lot of the, re well, not designed the restaurants, but kind of said, we need a restaurant that seats this many people, has to be open this many hours a day. Here's your budget. Wow. And so Mirage really took on the risk, right? It's always the toughest to... <laughs> to be the first and they're like all right screw it we're building the biggest most beautiful resort in las vegas and we're going to charge like it and pry everybody wait around with bated breath to see what would happen it worked yeah. for them and then it sounds like spago like they yeah and that was that was the direct reaction of course caesars is right next to the mirage and they had to up the ante what could they do well let's build the forum shops and then let's ha have a celebrity chef that'll be our lord and so that was early 90s. And then at what point did, now, so they started charging more, non-gaming revenue increased, increased, yeah. increase. At what point did non-gaming revenue surpass gaming revenue? On the Strip, 1999. You know, after that, and it was 50-50 then. Now it's about two-thirds non-gaming, one-third gaming. So it's consistently, for the past 25 years, been sliding more and more towards non-gaming, and it's continuing to slide that way. Now, in your opinion, what do you think it's going to, the pendulum is going to swing back the other way in the sense that, you know, more and more people, you hear chatter, people feel nickel and dimed, and probably rightfully so with, you yeah. know, uh, resort fees just hiking, jacking up, jacking up, uh, charging for parking, just every, the non-gaming piece, everybody's just kind of squeezing to find new revenue. Mm -hmm. Do you think maybe any of the new resorts that are going up will try to capitalize and say, hey, look, we're going to bring back value or maybe a Tropicana or, or one of the older <laughs> resorts on the Strip may try to embrace that? Or, I mean, what, what do you think? It just seems like since everybody's going that way of kind of nickel and diming and squeezing more revenue, there may be an opportunity to bring value. I think someone can try that. I think it probably won't be a publicly traded company just because they're supposed to drive shareholder holder value all the time. And it's really hard to say, well, yeah, we're doing this because we think it'll be better, as opposed to, well, if we institute this fee, we're gonna get an extra $50 million a year towards the bottom line. You know, you can see that. 
you can't see, well, we instituted this fee, we got 50 million more dollars, but we lost 60 million dollars in business. You know, that's not going to make it in any chart because how do you how do you document that? You really can't. So I think if somebody was going to try that approach, it would have to be a non-publicly traded company who ran the casino. And for me, I, I think that would be great. It's always great to have more options for the customers, and I think that would put pressure on other companies just to say, what do we consider to be the standard for true customer service? Yeah, that's a great point in, in the cost structure of these casinos because they take on so much debt to build these structures or to buy out whoever the previous owner was that they have these massive monthly payments that mm -hmm. if they uh, they take a shot on something that cuts down the revenue they're expecting, mm -hmm. it, it's t the point being it's tough to play the long game where if they said, all right, let's cut these fees. We think over the course of a year, we're going to attract more business. And yeah, But if you miss your month, you know, yeah. a few months in a row, you're, you're done. You're defaulting on that, on that debt. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's tricky. That's mm -hmm. a tricky one. Um, so <laughs> as you were talking, I was noticing the, the mushroom cloud yeah. in the, in the back. I feel like I remember you telling me that with the, <laughs> when they were doing the nuclear tests, there were some concerns of the, in the casinos that it may, affect the games what was what was the concern yeah. about the nuclear tests well the casino bosses were nervous about the casino about the the tests when they started in 51 52 they were worried that it would cause the shock wave from the bomb blast which were about 60 or 70 miles away from downtown vegas their biggest concern was it's going to make the roulette ball jump out of the wheel <laughs> and mess that up and what do they do if that happens that was the biggest concern <laughs> that's too funny but thankfully it never happened yeah, so they got that figured out, and after that, they really liked it. They promoted it. They actually would cater to people. They would have they would have bomb parties, so you would have a party. They usually went off at dawn, so you would be partying all night, playing music, and then watch the thing go off, watch the bomb go off. <laughs> wow. When was the last bomb that went off? Uh Above ground testing stopped in 1962 with the partial test ban treaty. That was U.S. Soviet thing. Uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev. The little bit of my history 102 creeping in there. Sorry. <laughs> and the test site itself stopped underground testing for the next 30 years. They did underground testing. That stopped in 1992. Got it. Kind okay. of an interesting fact. So there were over a thousand nuclear detonations at the test site, which is about 45 percent all the nuclear detonations in the world happened in Nevada at the test site. It's kind of wow. kind of incredible to me. Is that where you can see the three-eyed fish and the uh, huh. be surprised, but the, the glowing yeah. cactuses and things like yeah, that? Yeah, they really nuked the crap out of the desert. <laughs> underground of the desert. They really nuked that a lot. Awesome. Well, you know what? Last question I was thinking about this, because last time I was there... Uh, in and out Burger had recently opened. Um, I remember one, one story where Denny's on the strip, like, shut down. There's something, some construction yeah. happened, and Denny's went down, and they actually brought it up in their shareholder meeting because that particular Denny's drove so much volume. And it seems like with most, most of these chain restaurants, the location on the strip is the biggest mm -hmm. in their brand. So our... Do you know, are, are these kind of chain restaurants, are they just clamoring, like, hey, let it let us in? Is it? Oh, yeah. Or is it, okay, so it's mainly like they're yeah. just pushing, like, to find a spot on the strip, and then the casinos are um, just kind of picking and choosing who they bring in? Or is that how yeah, the, they, that works? They make a ton of money doing this, so that's why they do it, and they are really profitable locations. So they, you do have that. You know, I always wonder, well, why would somebody want to go all the way to Vegas and eat at Denny's? But there's a big need for that. And some people don't want to be culinary tourists and looking for new stuff. They just know they're hungry. Maybe they're drunk. Maybe they're not. They just know they're hungry and they want a Grand Slam breakfast or whatever. So that's why you've got Denny's and Outback and other places like that have done really well on the Strip. No, I... I've been there before where I, I blew my bankroll at the, uh, at the blackjack table and all of a sudden the $8 burrito at Chipotle sounds like, yeah. it, like it fits my budget. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Well, 
Thank you, Dr. Dave. Is there anything else that kind of milestones or cool things about dining in Vegas that we didn't touch on? We covered it all. So good, good questions. We got it all. All right. Well, if anybody wants to uh, experience some fine dining at sea, hmm. you can join us July 30th at the UR Conf Meetup at Sea, where Dr. Dave and I will be there. We'll be yeah. on the Royal Caribbean, which is actually well known in the cruise industry for some of the finest dining at sea. Mm -hmm. So we will talk about the business of Vegas. This will be one of the things that I'm sure will be weaved in there, because I know Steve yeah. Wynn is one of the yes. topics you'll touch on. So, uh, so anyway, uh, we still have space available. Uh, I think we've got a couple spots available. So. Definitely check okay. it out on the UR Comp website, the July 30th meetup at sea. And thank you, Dr. Day. We look forward to speaking with you next week. Likewise.